scripture reading this morning comes from James, chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say they have faith but do nothing to show it? Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? Imagine a brother or sister who is naked and never has enough food to eat. What if one of you said, go in peace, stay warm, have a nice meal? What good is it? if you don't actually give them what their body needs. In the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. Someone might claim, you have faith and I have action, but how can I see your faith apart from your actions? Instead, I'll show you my faith by putting it into practice in faithful action. The last two weeks we've been focusing on how John Wesley came to understand how he's justified by faith. Next week we're going to hear from John Wesley himself, and the horse has been confirmed. So now he won't be riding it into here, so if you want to see Wesley on the horse, you've got to go out to teeter. Uh, just in case you'd like to do both, he'll be here at 930 in Celebration Hall. Last year he had so much material, he did almost two completely different messages uh, so you can do both if you want. So we hope that you'll join us, especially out there for the picnic, whether you come here or go there for worship. John Wesley came to an understanding that he is saved by God's grace through both a literal storm and some personal storms that happened in his life. He was someone who strived so amazingly hard to prove to God he was good enough and believe me, his spiritual practices would put anybody else to shame, but there was still always something missing. And then through his experience at Aldersgate, and then through the help of talking to the Moravians, he came to an understanding and discovered that if he just lets go and trust God, trust in God, salvation is something he could gain in assurance. And for him, that changed everything. You would think that once one could relax in God's grace, you might kind of coast a little bit, but not John Wesley. It fueled him and gave him such even more energy that when he had a message that he had to share, and when the doors to the churches that uh, he was used to preaching in began to close because of that enthusiasm, he then took to open-air preaching. And so he began to preach to thousands, and you've already heard how many and how far that he went throughout his life. What a difference he made. But Wesley understood that there was more to faith than just trusting in God. That it needs to issue forth in some difference in one's life. And that's why we need to take very seriously this passage from James. Because it reflects so well that if we have a faith, it will issue forth in a life that can be identified, that helps. And he called that in his theology, Acts of Mercy real, tangible differences that it makes in people's life. And so often when you ask people if they know they're saved, most people are going to respond. They'll turn to morality. They'll, they'll compare themselves to everyone else and say, you know, I'm not such a bad person. I, I try to do the right thing. I, I, I'm not dishonest. Well, maybe with the IRS, but everybody else I'm fine. I, I don't hurt anybody, at least not intentionally. I work hard, I support my family, and we think that's good enough. But when you read James, you realize that's really not good enough. And when you listen to Jesus, you realize it's not good enough. In Matthew, he says, therefore, you'll know them by their fruit. And this is the part that kind of haunts me every time I read it. Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will get into the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. So let me give you some questions that I would encourage you to ask yourself if you really want to know if your faith is genuine, if you've really embraced salvation by God's grace. So first of all, ask yourself, how has Christ made a difference in my life the last six months? If you're not growing in your faith, you don't really have a faith. You can't just rely on something you did 20 years ago. What have I done in the past month for someone outside my immediate family? It's easy to love our children and grandchildren. 
your spouses, but what about those outside that close circle? And what if someone looked at my checkbook or my bank account or however you do your banking? Would it be obvious by how I spend those resources God has given me that I am a faithful person and that I'm a generous person? Because generosity is one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? And we're called to issue forth love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, and others. Has that grown in me? Can I say that I am more patient, more loving, more caring than I was one year ago? Or how about what Jesus says in Matthew 25? When you've done it for one of the least of these, when you fed the hungry, welcomed the stranger, visited the sick or imprisoned, when you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. And here's one more question. This actually comes out of the book, Five Practices of a Fruitful Congregation. What have I done in the last two months to make a positive difference in the world that I would not have done were it not for my relationship with Jesus Christ? I love that question. That one makes me think over and over and over. But understand we don't do these things to prove to God that we're good enough. It's not that we're trying to somehow work our way to heaven. Wesley understood that balance. Because remember, faith is by God's grace. We heard that last week as we read Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10. But if we have truly incorporated that faith in our lives, then something should be obvious. There should be something extraordinary about our lives. Something that makes us different, that sets us apart from the rest of the world. Apostle Paul said it very well in 2 Corinthians 5.17. So then if anyone is in Christ, that person is a part of a new creation. The old things have passed away and look, new things have arrived. There should be something that people can see and know that is different. Now, I can get excited talking about John Wesley. When John Wesley describes this kind of life, he describes them as acts of mercy, things we do out of response to what God has given to us within our hearts and minds that we have to issue forth to others. And Wesley did that so well. And we need to talk about it because we live in a world today where people are skeptical of faith. They don't think it really makes a difference. And for John Wesley, it made a huge difference. Let, let me just explain to you that when John Wesley was born in 1703, that year there were 5 million people in the country of England. 4 million out of 5 million people lived in absolute poverty. Four out of every five. By the time the Methodist movement had matured enough at the end of Wesley's life, 1 million people claimed to be Methodist. And had moved not only to a position of faith, but had moved out of an economic situation that was so poor and so destitute and so hopeless. Wesley made a huge difference. And he did so in so many real and tangible ways. They gave need, help to the needy. And they did so the most commonly way as they gathered together in class societies, little bands of people, small groups. And I'm sure the offering they took was often very meager. But when that was collected and all the bands accumulated that, what good they were able to do. They fed people. They clothed people. They bought medicine. They bought tools that helped put people to work. In the field of medicine, they made a huge difference. John Wesley just took a couple courses in basic medicine and first aid when he was at Oxford. But it was knowledge that most people didn't have, and so he wrote little treatises, passed it on to his class societies that they helped disseminate proper nutrition better ways to live. It is said that the Methodist movement offered the first pharmacy as they distributed to those, whether they could afford it or not. They started a rheumatism clinic. They started free clinics for those that could not pay much throughout the country. And then they helped people find work. They produced projects that would put people to work. And then they had this thing not only was it loans that were given to people, but they came up with what was called lending stock. They gathered 30 pounds to start this lending stock fund. And then they would loan out up to 20 shillings at start. People had to pay it back weekly for three months. Then that money went back into that collection to be help, used to help other people, and it grew. 
it said that in the first year of that lending stock fund, which is kind of a poor person's bank, they helped 255 persons, and then they continued to expand it from there. And they also helped people in the area of education, which was probably the most important thing. Literacy is the way out of poverty. And they did so in so many ways. They started schools. The first school was in 1739 in Kingswood, right near Bristol. And then they started one in Bristol, and then in Newcastle, and then in London. And they continue to expand. And what probably was the lasting impact was that Wesley instilled in all Methodists this urgency, this expectation that we have to educate our children. And that just continued to grow. And perhaps even more was the legacy that Wesley left. As that Methodist movement grew, they brought in and found new leadership, and they made an impact that continued on long after Wesley's life. How many of you heard of William Wilberforce? He almost single-handedly ended slavery in England. He was disciple, a disciple of John Wesley. William Wimbleforce says that John Wesley was the greatest man of his time in England. And in addition, the abolitionist movement was largely responsible because of the Methodist movement. They came to be William Wimbleforce and others. And it is said that John Newton, who happened to write this little hymn, have you heard this hymn before? Amazing Grace. Is it, does that sound familiar? Amazing Grace. John Newton wrote that. John Newton was a captain of a slave ship. But by reading a treatise that John Wesley wrote, it convicted him, and he gave up that trade. It was part of his transformation as a Christian. What an impact John Wesley and the Methodists had on England. Now, what's even more is there's things we can learn from this. I've been involved in helping agencies quite a bit. I've seen churches that start ministries, and I see them do it well, and I also see them do it poorly. And there's a couple things I think are so critical to understand. If we really want to make a difference in this world, if we want to help people move out of poverty, we need to embrace a couple things that the Wesley and the Methodist movement did so well. And one is he tied together so well the spirituality with the works of benevolence. They kept them together constantly. It's interesting to see how organic these ministries were. Like the lending stock. Think about how much pride and dignity was developed when those poor knew that this was their money that was helping to help others. And think about how naturally the literacy happened. It was encouraged in a couple ways. One, when they came together as class societies, they were encouraged to read the Bible, and so it gave them this desire to read. In addition, they sang hymns. Charles Wesley wrote thousands of hymns, and they would teach them to, the, to those bands of societies, those class societies, and they'd teach them line by line. They'd just shout them out one line at a time until they committed to memory, and then they could sing them by heart. In time, John Wesley had those hymns printed, sold very cheaply, and so people then could put to printed word what they already knew in their hearts. Didn't know how important choir was, right? The average class society sang five hymns every time they gathered together weekly. So add that up, that means they got a 30-minute literacy session every time they came together. And they didn't even know they were doing it. How organic that was. All these ways that Wesley touched their lives. But even beyond that, I want you to notice how their ministries were with the poor and not for the poor. Just like that lending society. They weren't giving to the poor. They were gathering the resources of the community as they came together. And it instilled a pride and urgency and understanding that they're doing this together, not being done for. I read a book a while back by Robert Lupton called Toxic Charity. Anybody else read that book? It's a great book. It's kind of like the book When Helping Hurts. But Robert Lupton 
for 10 years was a part of ministries in the city of Atlanta. He'd commute in from the suburbs. They put on all kinds of things, food pantry, Christmas giveaways. And then somehow he felt urged by God to move into the very neighborhood that he was helping. And he noticed a big difference. Now the people that he was helping were neighbors. And there was one experience that really transformed all that he did. He was sitting in the home of one of his neighbors, drinking coffee on Christmas Eve. It was a home, very humble home, but the floors were clean. You could smell the pine saw in the air. And they were waiting for some Santa's helpers. The kids were kind of excited. And he watched as the knock on the door came, and the mother went, and she received the family, a family from the suburbs. They had lots of gifts. The kids were all excited. And then he noticed something that he had never thought about before. The father that he was talking to, who was drinking coffee with him, got up and quietly slipped out. He noticed a little nervous smile on the wife who noticed what was happening with her husband. And something came together for him that he'd never thought about before. And he realized that all this help was emasculating this father who could not provide presents for his own children. And he realized that the children being taught that the good stuff comes from rich people out there they didn't even know. And so he began to rethink every ministry that he was doing. He even has developed some rules. If you read his book, he'll give some guidelines that he keeps with everything that he does now. But now he does ministry with the poor instead of to the poor. And John Wesley's movement understood that well. We need to understand that well for all that we do. It's helped me rethink everything I do. But in addition to that, John Wesley had it built into his theology. That phrase, works of mercy, became a part of his thinking that we do this not just because we're called to do it, we should feel guilty about it, or that we've got to prove something to God. We need to reach out and do tangible acts of mercy for our own benefit. He described it as a means of grace. Let me give you an example of how it happened to me this week. Last Sunday, Anita Beck and Pam Moore were telling me that Monday night was going to be our first Sunshine Friends of the New Year. And they said, you should come. They didn't make me come, but I knew if I didn't come, I'd regret it. I even had an opportunity to play tennis, came along, and I, I didn't bail. I said, okay, I need to do this. This will be good for me. And so Monday night I showed up, they'd already started, and I just hung out at the back of, the, of Celebration Hall, and I watched as they went through their beginning program. And people were very welcoming, they were thankful that I came up, cared enough to show up just to bless this ministry. And then they started the main part, the program for that month, which was karaoke and dancing. And they were having a great time. And I was having a great time at the back of Celebration Hall watching it, because if you ever seen me dance, you know that's where I should be. I don't know how I can be so coordinated on the basketball floor and so un uncoordinated on the dance floor. So I'm just back there just enjoying it, watching everybody have fun. And then Chelsea Crandall came up and said, come dance with me. Now, I don't know if you know Chelsea, but she's somebody it's hard to say no to, right? She's just a sweetheart. So, of course, I say yes, and we come out on the dance floor, and you know, at that point, I didn't care what I looked like. I was just glad to be a part of the joy that everyone's experiencing, and it's just always an honor to be with Chelsea. She's just a special person, and that's the means of grace. That's God shaping me into Christ-likeness. And that's perhaps the most important reason that we need to do these things. Not to prove anything to God, not to prove anything to anyone else, but because it makes us like Christ. And we'll be blessed because of it. So I hope <clears throat> that we embrace both grace as God's means of salvation, but also find to let that fuel us and energize us and motivate us to find those places where we can truly make a difference. Working with those in need and not for those in need. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, we thank you 
for Wesley's thinking, his theology, and especially his ministry. There's so much we can learn from it. Help us to practice that well in our day and our age. Help us to be creative and find those ways that we can truly get out there and, and work with people to make this world like the kingdom of God that you intend. This is our prayer in the name of Christ, who is our Lord. Amen.